Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, everybody, to a, another episode of Sarcasm and Orgasm. Thank you, thank you so much for joining and tuning in. So before we get started, make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel right down below. I mean, you're already here, so why not go ahead and get your daily dose of sarcasm? So... came across uh, this woman, she is going to educate us more about everything when it comes to finances. And also, we're going to talk about her podcast, which is very different um, in itself. So I would love to welcome my guest from my hometown, my hometown, straight from the 313 herself. I would love to welcome my guest, Miss Keisha Carr. Hi, thank you for having me, Will. Uh, thank you so much, Keisha, for joining me. So I know about you, but please let everybody know um, who you are and about your business ventures, please. So again, I'm Keisha Carr. Um, I have three business ventures of my own. The first one being Credit in Conversation. It'll be um, it's a credit literacy program. We also do restoration with our mm-hmm. business. Um, My priority with Credit in Conversation is to educate our community about credit and how it can benefit and enrich our quality in life and our community if we are able to invest because although cash is king, credit is everything. So um, my big passion is just educating people about credit. Um, Right now, my focus is on youth because... um, most of us tend to mess up our credit when we're young. Um, or it's already but, messed up for us. I mean, I say, or it's already messed up for us. So. Yeah. So right now I'm focusing on youth. I have a book on Amazon called Everything High School Students Need to Know About Credit um, from Credit and Conversation. And now I'm focusing uh, my niche or my focus now is. Um, people who are recently uh, were recently incarcerated and are coming home to re-entry into uh, civilization or the world whatever term you choose to use Mm -hmm. but um, just helping them get refocused and uh, being influential in society because typically we tend to teach them um, behaviors and helping them get a job but now in this day and age even with the job some jobs require good credit and they'll eventually need a place to stay once they are out of jail or from their parents' house or whoever house they're at. Um, so I want to make sure they have credit education and they have good credit before they go out into the world. So that's my new big venture is just teaching people who are re-entering society about credit. Um, and then I have uh, Lip Lover, which is L-I-P-L-U-V-H-E-R. It is a lip gloss line that I started with my 10-year-old daughter um, back in 2020 before COVID. So uh, it's a, a joint venture because we both love lip gloss. Um, and the primary focus for me with her doing a uh, joint venture is to create one generational wealth. Um, two, to educate her and expose her to dealing with people and speaking and good communication skills and leadership and sales tactics um Mm -hmm. and then my next business venture is dating satan which is (laughs) s which in a podcast i want to dispel the myth that the man is always satan um for me i mean i've been satan so I, i like to touch on the fact that I've been Satan. I share my personal experiences. And um, Satan does not only exist in relationships between heterosexuals, but it, with homosexual relationships, same-sex relationships, within family, within work relationships. So, um, mm-hmm. the biggest goal of dating Satan, but we definitely touch on how relationships can be toxic and how you can heal from them. And then I have a podcast that I recently started with a group of five phenomenal women on Podcasting Network. Um, it's called Respectfully Speaking. We touch on just everything from family to finances to conspiracy theory to what's going on in Detroit to comedy to religion. 
Um, we definitely have a variety of people on the podcast, a great demographic. Um, and it shows that black women can work together cohesively. We can communicate, we can compromise. And also I'm on Women on the Rise. It's a nonprofit um, empowerment group for women. And with that group, I sit on the board and my passion with that is just teaching people um, how to have a business, how to run a business, how to use social media to their benefit, marketing and promo, um, and just building business credit. So that's my other one. And I'm also on a radio talk show here in Detroit on Fridays on 9, 10 a.m. called The Urban Conservative. I co-host with Carrie Leon Jackson. And on Fridays, we talk about relationships. Um, and then I'm just a, a podcaster and now I've become a talk show guest. So I have a lot of things going on on top of I deal with, um, I've been involved in a lot of political things and campaigns here and set on some campaign committees. So I'm well-versed, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got that right. You're well-versed and very busy. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so I'll, let's back up a little bit so your book credit and conversations basically is for the use how did you come up with the concept for it and how long did it take you to like start it and then complete it and then get into the transition to where you can put it in everybody's hands to start talking about credit to our youth so what made me decide to do the book was just my personal experience and experiences with people I know. Um, I graduated from Michigan State like 20 years ago almost. So um, most people, um, we come out of college and because we're not informed or educated on credit and how credit score breaks down and typically we all have this myth that as long as you pay your bills on time, you'll have good credit and that's not true. So I really wanted to focus on creating good credit habits for young people, letting them, educating them on how the credit score breaks down, how to maintain good credit. Um, And I would say it took me maybe like two months to write the book. Um, So it took me two months to write the book. Uh, I was already on a platform with my credit and conversation that I already speak a lot. Um, and do workshops and seminars and I'm already in a circle with churches um, here locally so they gave me a platform as well to speak with the youth groups and I'm kind of connected to youth programs uh, athletic programs and uh, mentoring programs already before I even just did the book so it was kind of easy for me to use that platform and the connections I had to um get that book into people's hands and speak about it um just because i i'm already on podcasts i already talk a lot about it and i'm already on the radio about it so i've always already had a platform to kind of expose people to what i was doing Mm -hmm. and so what uh has been what has been like the biggest eye opener from the people you spoke with when they come that they've learned from the book that someone might not ever know for high school students, you'll be surprised that most of them don't even know what credit is or how it benefits them. Um, I do a lot of Zoom. I do a lot of meetings and workshops with young people. And you'll be surprised how many of them don't even know what credit is or um, what a credit card is. Just that that's money you have to pay back and it's a credit limit and how it affects your score if you're late on it or you max out the card. So that's been the biggest thing is just them not even knowing anything at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because I just did a video uh, basically last night, well, no, the other day with a good friend of mine and we were talking about how college is really a scam and it's set up in ways to where it doesn't benefit you especially like you graduate from high school you go straight to college it was like oh you can't afford this here's a credit card max this out and then you'll be in debt for the rest of your life on top of the student loans that you're already taking out so yes credit is a big hindrance to us all if we do not know about it 
And then when we do find out about it, it's almost too late because we're transitioning in from our 20s into our 30s. And then it was almost like we're playing more catch up than we ever have before. And it's almost not, it's not fair. So it's really, um, it's really great to hear that you took a real, real strong initiative to teach at an early age about credit because credit can be so beneficial for you if you do it in the right way. Like even say for instance, like if I have a child, put him on as an authorized user so he starts building um, uh, you know, credit information, not for me, just to him. That way when he gets his first credit card, him or her, give or take, that they already have some type of establishment, some type of rapport. And most of us don't even have that. And I think it's really unfair because these schools, they're not even teaching necessary. And I mean true necessary things that can really help us rather than deter. But when you go to public schools, public schools really don't care. They just want to push you through. They're like pushing you from the cradle basically to the grave, honestly. And that was my thing. It was it was like we come out of college in the red because one we have bad credit and on top of bad credit we have student loans mm -hmm. so most of the time when we graduate we have to go back and live with our parents because we can't get a place of our own because our credit is bad and then you're trying to get a job in the field or a job in general and you still are in debt you, and I, I totally agree that um I wouldn't call college a, a ripoff. I will say that, yeah, it is a ripoff. I, I say yeah, this, it's a ripoff. This, I, I say this in the sense of they'll have you take a math class that is harder as a remedial math class than some of the classes you need that will count towards your credit, or just classes in general. And you're paying for those classes if you fail multiple times, but they're not set up sometimes for you to even pass. So now they're creating where you have to continually. And I say this, unless you're doing like a full big workload in college, you're probably going to be on a five year program. So they're mm -hmm. creating revenue because you got to take the classes and then you have to pay for room and board. So college is definitely to me a business. The best benefit to college is creating a network for what you can do once you get out of college. I tell people all the time. None of the things I've learned in college have been influential to where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. It's what I met while I was in college that I've networked with, and that's been most beneficial beneficial to me in my career. So that's to me is the biggest plus is just the network of it all because most people you go to school with are future lawyers, doctors, principals, teachers. Um, so it put me in a place where I can it opened the door for me to do this platform and to educate people because I've met the, made those relationships in college and now those people are in a leadership position where they can bring me in. Yeah, and it's tough. It's tough to really build a network of people that you know are going to be beneficial because they might be in the same the same circle you're at but they'll venture out and they stick with stick to it we all know that people you've been in your freshman year don't always make it to their senior year they really don't <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then it's like that credit thing it'll stick with you because you'll probably find a good job while you're in college and then you'll be paying it paying it and then one month it happens to where you just fall right off and it's just hard to get back on so credit is something that we don't know about but we try to play with but we still don't know everything because it is not taught no one wants to teach us even if you try and i don't mean to get political racist but even when you try to go to the white men and say hey teach me about credit so i can be better just for me not take it back to the community but just for me it's almost like the door is shut and i love this saying is knowledge is meant to be shared but no yep. one wants to share any knowledge with nobody everybody wants to keep everything to themselves and i feel that's very very unfair when it comes to a, a serious situation such as credit and conversations yeah and that's why i came up with the name and credit with credit and conversation because we're talking credit and instead of me just lecturing to you and i say this to people i said when i do seminars or workshops i make it a conversation because after five or ten minutes especially with youth they're tuned out so you have to mm -hmm. engage so they'll follow along and they can ask questions and they'll feel comfortable that's why I took the conversation route credit and conversation like we need to have this conversation so 
um, to what you were saying about sharing the knowledge. And that's why I said, people, I said, I do restoration, but I don't do restoration unless you do a one-on-one -on -one literature course for me. I teach you certain things, the laws about credit. Because when I originally started learning credit, um, I educated myself from a, a law aspect, from the 607 law to the 609, 611. I really learned the laws of the FCRA, CROA. I took that perspective and I want to share that knowledge because most people, it's a ton of repair, repair companies out of here. Repair, mm -hmm. they'll dispute some letters, send them out and they might come back on your credit. And if you learn nothing from that experience, nine times out of 10, six months later to a year later, you're going to be back at that credit person's office asking them to repair your credit again. And they're going to take your money again when we should have educated you so you won't find yourself in this position again. So if you do, at least now you know that information where you don't have to call me again. You know how to fix it yourself. Yeah, and I'm not trying to show anybody. I just think those places are really a ripoff because if you're not really taking initiative to find out what's on there and you say, oh, my credit jacked up, and you just allow them to see everything, they got all your information. And I think that's unfair because that's putting you in a very vulnerable position because other than um, our like date of birth, our social security number, that's something that's attached to that. It's almost like we can't get rid of, we have to keep safe. So giving something like that to someone, that's very, very, very risky. Um, and I look at it like, I found out about my own credit by just going up and looking at stuff. And then I remember I had this long list and I was one of those people who, my own father used my information because him and I had the, the, almost the same names and same social, except our socials are backwards. So it's, it's different. Yeah, I know. And then when I found out, it, it took me about four, four and a half, five years to clean it up. And then I was able to do everything I wanted to. Now, granted, I'm not in that high echelon of the eight sevens, but I'm still in that mid tier of sixes to where I'm good, but not great. But it took work. It took going from a secure car to unsecure to, you know, getting these little builders to like getting just a little personal loan, whether it be 500 hundred or a thousand and then buying a trade line so it took steps to get to where it was but it's about doing research and that's the problem with people they're not willing to do research to find out what could help you and what could hurt you and especially with black people because we're lazy we just think oh well it ain't gonna affect me i'll be all right but no no we just we always want to take the easy way out and but never take the steps to get to what they say that financial freedom so to speak and that's what I've, I've learned over the years of doing it is a lot of people be like, well, I'd rather you do it. And I, mm -hmm. that's why I, I, and I'm okay with losing some clients or people not wanting to work with me because I require you take a one-on-one -on -one literacy course and I educate you. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to learn. They'll say stuff like that. I don't want to know. You just do it. If, if you want me to just do it, then I'm not the credit person for you because <laughs> I'm not here to just get a check or to get your money monthly or a subscription. My passion is education. So mm -hmm. I get myself to learn something about credit because credit laws change daily, fluidly. Like even with the the recent thing today with Biden saying, if you make under 125,000, you have 20,000 in Pell Grant, they'll forgive. If you don't have Pell Grants, it's 10,000. We just have to constantly keep ourselves abreast that you can go to studentaid.gov because most people didn't even know that, you know, you could, our loans, I mean, student loans were suppressed or on pause or hold um, to August of this year. And then they um, extended it to another four months to actually go pretty much to the end of the year. And most people don't know that. And some uh, financial institution or student loan companies are still putting that on their credit report and not abiding by the law that they were supposed to be on pause. And now those lates, those negatives, that reflects on your credit when they shouldn't even be on it because of the law that been passed to put them on pause. But Man, I will never forget, never forget. I think it was Obama's second term. I had a student loan on there that I was paying, you know, every month. But there was something that was passed and it got taken off instantly. Man, I was happy that a runaway save of papers. Like it just it fell off. I was so happy because you and you can understand that you pay each and every month on it. 
whether the payment plan or you have huge amounts, you pay a hundred dollars here every month consistently, and you think, damn, I'm never going to be able to pay this 22k off in 30 years. I'm at 90. <laughs> I bet ninety thousand. So I know. Oh wow! Oh Jesus! Okay. <laughs> I, I told you to get it. Um, <laughs> so that's another thing for me. Too. Like student loans are, I call them. I, I say student loans are the devil. They like the setup. Like they to me are the setup. You're you're supposed to be helping me. You want me to further my education, but then you're taking taking me to a place where once I get the education and the career, my my check is going to you. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. Um, that is definitely a, a thing for me with student loans. I have my quorums about, I feel like that's a rip off, but just, and, but I'm a credit tip. So a lot of companies will say, you know, consolidate your loans, right? Mm-hmm. Most people don't know when you consolidate your loans, say you don't have a credit card or you don't have a mortgage or rent or any other type of revolving credit, any other streams of credit on your credit report. If you consolidate all of your loans, but you've had them for like 10, 15 years. Say you removed from school 10, 15 years. Anything over five. That affects your history and your credit score, which is 10% of your score. So say your credit cards you've only had a year. You just got a mortgage. Once you consolidate those loans, your score is going to drop. Because now they don't reflect on your credit report. And they're taken away from the history part of it, which is 10% of your score, which is 85 points. Mm-hmm. So I tell people, if you're going to consolidate your loans... I would definitely suggest keeping one loan with the least amount of balance. Like I had a loan that was for some reason like $163. I don't know how I got it, but I was like, I was going to consolidate a few years ago. And I was like, well, I'm going to keep this $163 out because at this point I've had it for 17 years. So I need that to reflect on my history. So the count towards my 85 points and you can consolidate everything else and I'll pay the $163. So I can, so my score won't drop. So that's mm-hmm. another thing that people don't know when they do decide to consolidate is once you bundle those loans or consolidate them, your score is going to drop. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with Keisha Carr. She has multiple businesses, but she is talking about credit, about different things you can do to not drop your score, but possibly improve it. So um please pay attention and remember if you want to like know more she has a book on amazon called credit and conversations credit and conversations people it it gets it gets no thorough no straight to the point in that like (laughs) it really doesn't (laughs) um uh, so and let me ask you this: When you do your seminars with, that you host, what are some of the exercises that you have for these kids to try to get through them and tell them how important credit can be for the long term? So I don't necessarily do exercises because in this generation, they're based on social media. Let's just be real: TikTok, mm-hmm. Instagram. Most of people aren't into Facebook. So, and they're into like the celebrity life and jewelry and money and cars. So I try to, I'm not going to say try, we're not going to use the word try. I I reach them where they're at. So okay. I'm relatable because the first thing most of them will say is like, I want a car. I want this. I want this type of car. I want this type of house. So I have to make it relatable. You can't get this car with bad credit. You can't, you can get a 2000 10 with bad credit and your car note is probably going to be $700 because your APR is going to be low but I just try to make it relatable to things that apply to them that they're, they're, they are fascinated by and then I try to educate them on how to accomplish those goals with credit mm-hmm. so that's pretty much my approach is just making it where they can converse with me and tell me what they want or what they think good credit can buy and um, how do they think they can obtain good credit and then I tell them how but most mm-hmm. of them are kind of just like oh, I want what I seen Yo Gotti with or I with you know Little Yachty or whoever the little rapper is. but I have to make it relatable to them mm-hmm. so let me ask you this one um, when it comes to credit and attaining a credit card, who is it better to uh, build a relationship with is it a bank or a credit union I prefer credit unions. I love Navy Federal Credit Union. 
I absolutely love credit. Well, not everybody can get it in Navy Federal, so. Okay, so if you can't get it in the Navy, <laughs> but I love credit unions more just because it's so many different things that are being exposed and lawsuits, class action lawsuits with different banks. I'm not going to name any just for, you know, I don't want us to be in trouble. But a lot of these banks are getting in trouble for from anything from redlining with mortgages to um, overcharging draft fees. And you don't tend to see that with credit unions. Mm -hmm. um, credit unions are typically more lenient and they are more giving with credit limits with their credit mm -hmm. card. So I'm definitely okay. a credit so union. When did you find it, find this out to where it was better uh, long-term wise to go with a credit union instead of a big bank per se? Uh, I probably found it out actually in college because I, I banked with MSU Credit Union. I, I worked for the states, um, for the Senate office. So I worked, I had a state employees credit union. And then at the time, I think I might've had either um, mbd or chase or something like that and it was just everything about it was total opposite in the interaction with even just from customer service to how they treated their clients and the credit limits and just the various things that were obvious to me that the credit union was better and the credit union that's owned by uh its members versus the banks are owned by the banking institution so that's why I'm a proponent of credit union. Okay. So I'm going to ask a personal question. Um, in my belief, I believe banks and even credit unions it might be a little bit different, but I believe all of them are nothing more than Ponzi schemes. Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. Why do you? Uh, I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme per se because... I know at least with the credit union I'm with, they actually send out credit, like credit information, mortgage rates, they're low. Um, and I don't want to keep my money in my house in my safe. So mm -hmm. I would rather go to the bank where I don't have access. It helps me save. It's not readily available. Granted, I stay in the burbs here in a uh, suburban area of Detroit, but what if somebody just so happens to break in my house? And then they got all my cash. Mm -hmm. my, money is my, my money is protected in the bank by FDIC mm -hmm. so, um, my money accures no interest um, sitting at my house my money accures interest at the bank I make money off of my money with the bank versus it just sitting in my house oh I get that I mean we're not out here talking about living the door boy life no I'm just saying you'll be surprised <laughs> I'm but just I'm saying no, no go ahead I just definitely, I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. I just think it's, um, it's corporate America is the nicest way I can say it. Yes, it is corporate America. I look at it like this, um, and I see it as a Ponzi scheme because you're going to take my money and then go give it to someone else so they can get their money. And since I'm the low guy on the totem pole, you're just giving it to your bigger, more charitable members who needs it more than I do. Granted that... You know, I work every day for it, and then I have those some days. It's like, okay, well, we got overdrive fee, so we're just going to go ahead and take care of it, but we're still going to charge you. But then the now, other person who actually needs it, go ahead. Now, it can go the other way. It can go, a person has it to be like, I put my money in this bank for you to give someone who doesn't have it a loan. Or, you know, it can go both ways. They can feel like, I put my money in the bank, and you're giving it to someone take advantage of for a loan or to help with their fees or to get them a higher credit card limit so it actually it actually go both ways they can feel like you're taking advantage of their money yeah they, so it's it's just a ponzi scheme that keeps spinning no matter what um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just I, being cynical about it i am i i i invest in in uh i different accounts but i would say that I realized after doing it, sometimes it's better for me to just take my chance with the stock market. Mm -hmm. I've been in the stock market, then I have let my money sit in the bank. 
Yeah, I was just talking to someone. Uh, we were talking about a crypto account, how it has a compounding interest of over four and a half percent. So I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't deal with crypto, Bitcoin, nothing bad. <laughs> I, like right now, the travel industry is grooming, is back up. That's probably where that's the best thing for me in the stock market. I don't kind of miss mix with the other stuff just because I haven't taken an, enough time to educate myself. Mm -hmm. And I know people might not like what I'm about to say, but everybody I know that kind of do Bitcoin and crypto and Forex, it's more of a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme because they're making money off of signing you up and getting you under them. And most of them still aren't financially free. Yeah. If you do it great with crypto and Bitcoin and Forex, why are you going to your job? You still punching the clock, so it can't be that great. True, true. That's why I would try to be more financial free with my credit cards. That way I can get that Amex card that I've been wanting for two years. I see it every day on my screensaver because that will allow me to do things that I want to. Um, and that's another thing that people should know about credit cards. Instead of a debit card, your credit card can work for you because the more you use it, you get points back and you can go different places, travel and everything. And no, not everybody uh, heeds to that because you, you just use your debit card. What are you getting back? A bill and an overdraft fee. I literally said today on the talk show I was on. I said, and this, I, I say this all the time, I say that um, you get no benefits to using your debit card. So I use my credit card to pay for everything and then I'll pay it off like the end of the week, but I get my cash rewards and I'll use my cash rewards to pay off my credit card. So at this point, I'm using their money to pay them. Mm -hmm. I always suggest, and I, and I tell young people this, um, that if, when they're deciding to get a credit card, Make sure you ask, what is the benefit to me and what are you offering me as far as rewards, points, miles, cash back. Never get a credit card where you're paying an annual fee and you're getting nothing out of it. Uh-huh. And see, I do nothing about that. Uh, I My first cash back reward card was a Discover It because, like I said, I had starter cards. So I was just trying to build and then I found Discover and then I was getting back 1% on everything that I was spending, which I didn't know at the time. But now that was really great. It really was. And then I have built with them. So now it's increased to where I have a better rate with them. Now it's up to 3%, which is great. So now all, yeah, all I use it for is like my gas and groceries. Um, and then... And then sometimes I'll get that money back and I'll pay like my, 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 my balance off with no that's problem. That's what I, I always tell you, I said, I use their money to pay them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I will say that because you went out, you talked about American Express. Most people don't know that American Express does not report history, which is 10% of your score. So American Express only po uh, reports utilization and on-time payment. So you can have a, a, just let's say you only have American Express card, right? And you can pay on time. You can keep your utilization to, let's say, 5%. You can get the max amount of points, which is like 190, 92 points for on-time on payments. Your utilization is roughly like 175 points to 183. Say you have a 0% of your credit utilization. You still get the 192, the 175, but you're still missing 85 points in that category just because American Express does not re report history. I'm okay with that because I have three other cards. But like just didn't have American, like if you didn't okay. have that cards, because yeah. I, there's a lot of people be like they want to buy trade lines. And I say, I look at your credit, I look at people's credit report and look at the summary and I say to them, okay, well, you don't have any history it's your new card before you buy a trade line or invest in a trade line american express is not going to really help you because there's no history on it and you don't have any any already so you need to get a card that has history mm -hmm. yep. so that's what i always tell people um when they're purchasing a trade line if that company doesn't offer to review your credit report 
and see what card works best for you. They're in it just to take your money. They don't care if you if your score actually rises or don't rise. They'll tell you anything. If they haven't did a summary of your credit report, they're just giving you anything to get your money. Wow. So much knowledge. Just so much. Like, where were you, like, four years ago? I could have needed all this. Like, I had to find out the hard way. <laughs> I was here. Anytime you want me back here, I am here. I, oh, no. I'm a passion for educating people. Oh, don't worry. We're, we're not done. We're, we're about to transition. We're, we are. <laughs> so, so, you have your podcast, right? Called Dating Satan. Yes. Um, first off, how did you get into podcasting? And then where did you start branching off to where you wanted to create your own? So, ironically... I was dating someone and he was Satan. One of my friends even said it like, girl, you dating Satan. This is like years ago. And I started writing a book about it. Mm-hmm. So then um, I opened a Facebook group, um, which like expanded rapidly. It was like a public group. So I actually shut down the group. Well, I've been shut down twice. So now it's kind of private. But the group expanded so fast and people were willing to share their testaments and their stories about dating Satan. I was like, you know what? Let me do a to get I was actually just trying to get content for my book. I was like, I'm gonna do an all female podcast where all of my guests are female. And then I did an all male podcast just to get two different perspectives. And I posted it in my group. And someone that was in the group um, that I had previous knowledge from campaign stuff with. Um, out of Seattle, seen it, and he was starting a podcast network. He loved what I was doing. Well, actually, you know what? That was the day of Satan. Maybe back in 17, 18, I was on Everyday, what is it called? Everyday Podcast as a guest, and then I did Everyday Travel because I travel a lot. So I had kind of had some podcast experience, but Dayton Satan actually just came from me getting content for my book. And doing some like pilot shows just to get content and somebody seeing it and it was like, you should do your own podcast, make it a regular thing. Um, they invested into my podcast. They, I can market in from marketing a product and it literally just opened from dating. And I did the same thing you do. I used um, Restream Virtual instead mm-hmm. of person. And for me, what I found with it is it exposed me to a bigger audience versus being in studio. And I'm currently in studio with the new one I started with Respectfully Speaking. But this platform and how you're streaming it, it allows you to get a bigger audience. It allows you to um, get guests from everywhere. Because although you can do it in in the, you can bring them in, in the studio when you're in person, it's just not the same as because when you're in person, it's like the in-person conversations and it's hard for the person that's on camera to come in. Mm-hmm. So this kind of works best for me because the the um, network I'm in, on for dating Satan is different from the one I'm on for Respectfully Speaking. But every network, every podcast on that network, I was the only person from Michigan. So it was Seattle, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Arizona and these are people who have been podcasting for a while who had big platforms so it exposed me and gave me opportunities when we we had to share go on each other's shows so that gave me an opportunity to get a bigger audience where sometimes mm-hmm. the video limits you yep it limits your audience it makes you local so that was the biggest thing with that but I actually it was just a blessing that came up for me and then um because my group is kind of doing so well and I kind of kind of try to condense it because people share their personal stories I didn't want it public anymore but um kind of from dating Satan it kind of opened up the door for me to speak about relationships and get on the radio talk show talk about relationships um it just definitely opened more doors so October 2nd I'm doing bold and beautiful it's a woman empowerment group, but they do panels. So I, I literally got invited to host a panel with males about their perspective on dating with women and to give women tips. So 
it just definitely opened more doors um, with Dayton Satan. And it's been a great experience, opportunity. Most importantly, I learned a lot about how women are crazy, worse than men. Because when I listen, <laughs> listen to some of these guys' stories, I'd be like, oh my God. Like, I just told somebody the other day, we were just talking, because a lot of people talk to me because the dating saying just about relationships and seeking advice. And he was saying how um, this one chick just keep popping up in his house. He see her on the ring camera. What should he do? He trying not to hurt her. And I was like, you got to get a PPL at this point. Like, he like, I don't want her to lose her job. I said, you want her to lose your job but you to be sitting in the cleaner? Because at, at one point, sometimes you're not going to, you're going to be at, at a point sometimes where you're not going to be able to restrain yourself because it's getting to that point now. So, mm-hmm. you worried about her and not about yourself, which obviously shows you still care, which is good, but women and people are out here now killing families and if I can't have you, nobody can have you. And I've been in a situation where the person was like, I'll kill us both. What? Or, yeah, that's too much. Kobe, kill itself. Or, you know, I, I don't even want to be in a position where somebody tells me they love me so much they can't live without me. Because what that says to me is that if you can't have me, no one can have me and you'll kill me if I, if I don't want to be with you. And most people tend to ignore those signs. You got to listen to words. You got to listen to words, red flags, action. And you have to decide what you like what you dislike and what you're not going to tolerate and a lot of times people and I say this abroad especially because I'm over 40 especially with women over 40 we tend to um, want this pick and fit lifestyle especially if we're like college educated and got a successful career we're now pushing marriage 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 and sometimes because we're pushing it because you feel like you're so established or I've done the right thing and went to college you'll marry anybody to ask you where you haven't you haven't gotten to know that person, their characters, their morals. You just want to get married because it's what I'm supposed to do or what people tend to think I should do because I'm established. Um, so I, I, I definitely like to speak on not being put on like you pressure to get married and that marriage doesn't validate you. Like I know some Christian people and I'm Christian. I am definitely Christian. That's what they all say. I'm just I'm, I'm <laughs> And I just had this conversation with my girl. I want to get married, but it doesn't validate me as a person. If mm-hmm. I girl and they put my little friend in my obituary that I, I'm dealing with now, <laughs> put me in his obituary as his special friend. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with having a team without a title. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think a marriage defines my relationship, my connection, my vibe, my loyalty to the person. It's great to have, but people don't respect marriage like they used to. It's a lot of married people out here. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are a lot of married more single, people. single people than I meet single single people. Mm-hmm. I need to say it myself. Um, she tried to poison me, like literally tried to poison me. Uh, and I've talked about this a few times on different podcasts I've been on, even episodes I have. Like she put uh, some type of poison in my body wash. And it happened probably about a year before COVID. And I'll put it to you like this. So you know how you get a scratch, like you'll scratch yourself and you get a line or something, okay? Well, picture that 20 times worse. I would scratch myself and blood will already start coming out. Yes, yes, no lie. Um, and even when I went to the dermatologist to try to figure it out, they didn't know. They had to give me the strongest steroid antibiotic whatever it was to get it out of my system and then i had to clean everything that i had touched i had slept in whatever because they thought it got into my clothes so i was washing two days basically butt naked yeah and that's i say and and i own the fact that i've been saying and, and women i think women could be more conniving more delicious more yeah. difficult the men, men at this point, especially like at 40, most men are like, okay, they are, they don't even want to go back and forth. And it's the men that likes to go back and forth, especially over 35, he's tender. Can I cut some here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> most men that are older that like to go back and forth or who are homotional, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> 
what I've learned, I, I, I definitely, in every relationship, situation, every bad experience, fling, whatever you want to call it, I tend to reflect on what I did wrong, what I didn't pay attention to, and what the other person did wrong, and I allowed. And what I've seen a pattern is, is most men who are emotional, who do feminine things, didn't have a male role model in their life. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. father, I'm saying male role model. I'm a Sunday school teacher, a preacher, a basketball, football coach, track coach, any male role model in their life to influence them to be a man. Every man that I've dealt with to act like a tender grew up around a, a bunch of females. And that was one thing I had to learn. Like, okay, the last guy I dated, I, I tell him, I said, I was in a lesbian relationship with a man. And it starts coming out like, I'm very, I'm a public private person. So like private person, so my, my social media, you'll see everything I'm doing. You'll see about my business, my kid, I crack jokes, where I'm at. But I will never put my personal business, who I'm dealing with or dating with, really on my social media. And the guy I was dating was like, he tagged, I hadn't even committed to a relationship with him. He tagged us on a post and put us in a relationship. And he would post everything, even when we got into it. He literally would record our phone call and then he posted them on Facebook. He'll nice. screenshot our conversations and post them on Facebook when we get into it. And it was and just how like, long were you with this nigga? From February to August. So maybe like six months. Oh, okay. And the part was like we went to high school together, but I didn't know him in high school. I knew of him. But mm-hmm. he had inboxing me literally for, I mean not inbox or well, inboxing me too like wait. But he had been cash apping me since 2019 for two years like he'll see me out uh, i'll post i'm out i'm out with my friends i'm out of town it's my birthday he'll just cash at me and i was like finally i'm like let me give him some attention because like you invested a lot of me in two years and i didn't even realize that he had cash at me so much so i'm like let me i look through my cash app history i'm like let me give him some attention and I tell him this, I said, you bought my time and my attention because you was persistent about, like, you. I'll be out one night, send me $100 for me and my friends to drink, send me another $100. Like, I'm like, let me get, let me see what he's talking about. So women be leery of guys who want to buy your attention. They have a hidden, a, a hidden agenda beyond just sex. People always assume it's just sex. Sometimes it's not even a sex for them. It's the being connected or the clout chasing or mm-hmm. your your network or your knowledge or how you can benefit them and put them on another level. Like, And I'm a firm believer. If I'm dating you, if I'm dating you or we're in a relationship, if I'm winning, we winning. Mm-hmm. So my network is your network. And it's not for everybody. It's just for someone I'm dating serious. If I'm, I'm in a position where I can see help, help or see you win, I'm going to. And then we're going to win together. And I want somebody that's confident. What I realize is I can't deal with a guy that is jealous of me. I need a man that's confident in his own. And being on his own with or without me, he's confident. And we well, walk you're in Detroit, about- so that's that's not going to happen. So You know what? So I'm dating someone now, and I just told him today, like, you are not like most Detroit dudes. I literally just told him, I said, you're not egotistical. You're not materialistic. You're not insecure. He's very confident, educated. He's a leader. I was like, you just like a breath. I tell him, and he'd be like, why you always have to do my peace? Like, he's refreshing. It's like a breath of fresh air. He motivates me. We motivate each other. We're supportive. It just works. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I would have never, and I normally date long distance. I don't typically date Detroit dudes. But, and what I do is like a bunch of bullshit. I'm just being honest. But this one is refreshing. I don't know where it's going, but it's definitely different to have somebody that offers you peace, where you feel happy, you're at peace. I'm not arguing, we're not going through it, you confident. If my phone rings, I can put it on speakerphone and we can both listen. And I ain't got no questions afterwards. Interesting. Very, very interesting here. Okay. Wow. Vice versa. Wow. Like, we've been honest with each other from day one that. I'm to a point where you, if someone comes to me and they have and try to tell me about him, he's put me in a position or we put each other in a position where you can't tell me about him and 
you, you can't tell him about me because I've already told him. One thing about mm -hmm. me, I'm so honest with myself and who I am that I feel like I'm going to tell you about me, offer it, so can't nobody else tell you, and I'm going to write my own narrative. And whether I did good or bad or hot, people be like, oh, she crazy. And I am. Because <laughs> it was so crazy. Somebody called me a while ago about my daughter's father. And it was like, this was years, years ago. And she was like, yeah, he told me you crazy. And I was like, I'm not insulting. He's warning you. Not insulting me. Leave me the fuck alone and don't call my phone again. Like, um... I'm just, I'm, I'm okay. And I've learned myself to know my buttons, my triggers and to find people who don't trigger me that don't bring out that side of me. When you find peace, it's just like the biggest thing, finding the person that brings you peace that you, I tell people this all the time. If I tell someone or a man or anybody, I respect you. Respect means more than love to me. And I say that in the sense of you can love somebody and not respect them. Because a person that loves you is not going to cheat on you. They're not going to embarrass you. They're not going to be out with another person. They're not going to be on social media flirting because they respect you. They can still love you. But if they don't respect you, their behavior reflects that. So if I respect you, that means more I'm not going to embarrass you. And if I respect you, at some point I'm going to love you if I don't mm -hmm. already. But respect yeah. me more than than love because people love people all day and cheat and have outside babies and all types of stuff Damn. they friends sneak with your friend because they don't respect you true very true wow ladies and gentlemen she is just dropping gems i hope you're listening and writing this shit down because it's only going to be said once if i get her on again it'd be a miracle because she just got so many things going on i'm just glad that i was able to get her on today <laughs> No, I, I so look, I love your energy, your professionalism, your Kalindi, your follow up, like anytime for you. Like you. And, you and you know what? It's just come from just from my first interview to whatever my last will be, probably never. But it's just asking questions that just make sense and fit. I don't want to just ask you no stupid things off the rip because we're doing it for a reason, you know? Not only are we talking about financial literacy, but we're talking basically about relationships. And both of these things matter if you can really have the cognizance. Yes, people, cognizance. Like, you have the brain power to be able to figure out why it's being said. Um, because these matter like when you deal with your credit that's a long-term thing when you deal with a relationship that is a long-term thing these are both things that you're putting your energy you're putting your time you're putting your money into and you have to be understanding of these two because they play vital roles in everything that you do relationships whether it's personal or professional um credit whether it's personal or professional like you need both in everything that you do um and so i appreciate you coming on i appreciate you talking with me hell i appreciate you giving me the time and the opportunity just to be able to talk to you in a serious but not so serious manner like i truly do i thank you so much for the information that you share with me i thank you so much for just telling me the things that matter the most um because you never know you don't know what you can find out if you don't open your mouth like it says a closed mouth does not get fed that is true <laughs> so anytime you want me back you just send me a call i hope i can get you on date and say i start recording uh in october for season two okay um like over a year just because i'm so booked with everything else and my group has kind of carried me through the last year and me going on other people podcasts and then mm -hmm. so I, right now it's like i can i've been floating with uh and i've reposted my show so it's kind of got me through just really being on other people's shows but i, I am back and i definitely like having guests and perspectives from everyone because mm -hmm. My perspective might not be yours. You might think every woman is an angel. No, every woman is not. <laughs> it's not. And yeah. my mom has always told me this because my mom is East Sider through and through. She would always say every woman, every man is an asshole. Every woman is a bitch. You just got to find the right one that matches you. That's true. <laughs> and I'm not trying to say it in a derogatory saying I'm not. It's just 
some women are some men are like we all are but in a sense we go together we need one without the other and you can find a really good one out here if you look in the right places but sometimes you find the right one in the most damnedest places you never would have thought of listen i i see everybody say and i posted this in dayton saying the other day i'm kind of a jokester I, I got a sense of humor i was like uh from my inbox to my guts a love story <laughs> yeah like the person, I this my piece I literally met on social media. In my mm-hmm. inbox, that I was like, eh. the craziest thing is like I I was gonna write when he first tapped on my inbox. I I had made messages to him and I was rude and I unsent them. I did two rude messages and I was like, no, I'm not gonna be like that. And he's definitely my type. Like I'm physically attracted to him. I was like, I'm not gonna be rude. And I get a lot of inboxes, but this one was just like. Something was different. And I'm glad I, I took that chance. So this is your cash out bay? Is what you're saying? Or is it a different dude? <laughs> what did you say? I thought it was... <laughs> no. The cash out. Oh, Lord. No, no. I had to get a on him. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, that's another, that's another, another episode. Another yeah. episode. But, um, Miss Keisha, it, it was so, so wonderful talking to you. Now, if people want to get in contact with you, get a hold of you, maybe do some credit financial, uh, get some tips on whatever it might be, how can they get a hold of you? So, on Instagram, it's credit and conversation um, all together. Uh, Facebook, it's um, credit and conversation, credit education services. As well, I have a, in a Facebook group called Credit and Conversation. Um, my website is www.imkeishacarr.com. It's my landing page. It'll take you to my lip gloss, Date and Satan, and uh, Credit and Conversation. From that page, it takes you to all three pages. And my email is jcarr.com at creditandconversation.com and my phone number for business is 313 5 I'm going to give you my first number 313-744-5753 wow wow okay well you heard it people you heard it here but thank you so much for joining me I greatly appreciate it I really do I really enjoy this so like I, I always tell everybody anytime you want to come back and you want to talk I'm always there just reach out to me and let me know we can go from there I, and I love the sar- sarcasm and orgasm like the name is phenomenal <laughs> I- well thank you thank you so much I appreciate that so I, um, you take care and please come back whenever you want to okay oh. alright don't tell me that I love this show like I love your energy <laughs> I'll be back <laughs> Definitely. I can't wait. I look forward to it. Just hit me up and let me know. All right. All right. Yes, people. So that was my guest, uh, Keisha Carr. Uh, We talked about everything from credit, which is so important. It really is in this day and age because we need credit with everything we do. So make sure you reach out to her for all your questions, all your needs. She will get you right. She will get you together. So this has been another episode of Sarcasm and Orgasm. I'm your host, Will, and I have my guest, Miss Keisha Carr. Also, let you guys know, if you want to support the channel, make sure that you click the link below for the official t-shirts of SNO. You can get them in 10 different colors and five different sizes. Yes. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. I had to think about that. So yes, go ahead. Check that out. And you know how we do it. We always get sarcastic. So until next time, I'll talk to y'all all soon.